Amen. Amen. All right. Um, I was kind of torn on where to start tonight. So uh, let me do my obligatory recap. Over the past several weeks, we have covered uh, the reality that uh, civilization began in, uh, in Africa, specifically in the land of Kush. Uh, we have covered um, evidence uh, demonstrating that Eden was located in a Kushite territory. Uh, we went on from there past uh, to the flood and discovered some things about Noah's children, particularly um, uh, Japheth and Ham. Uh, we discovered that Ham is the father uh, of the progenitor, as Zondervan says it, of the dark races, not the Negroes, and that, uh, and that uh, the first civilizations were black. The first world leader was black, and this is after the flood. Uh, Nimrod, uh, who was a Kushite, was the first world uh, leader. <clears throat> we also we also went on to discover that um, uh, Noah's oldest son, or at least he's considered to be his oldest son, Japheth, is the father of the Gentiles, and so that there would not be any doubt as to the general region of where the Gentiles reside, we showed a map of Paul, the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys and discovered that uh, as he is called the Apostle of the Gentiles, that he spent time in Europe. Uh, he did not visit any Hamitic lands, nor did he visit any Shemitic uh, lands. Uh, he being the Apostle of the Gentiles spent his time in um, what is commonly understood as uh, European lands. <clears throat> we further learned that according to the scripture, uh, Japheth is the father of the Gentiles and nowhere else in scripture, uh, no other people group has been identified as being Gentiles other than the descendants of Japheth. Uh, so, so what we've been taught uh, probably our entire Christian life, that, uh, that there are two kinds of people on the earth, Jews and Gentiles, is just simply not the case. Uh, the reality is that everyone who is not of the descent of, uh, who is not a descendant of Japheth, uh, is not a Gentile. Only the descendants of Japheth are Gentiles. We went through and discovered some of the, um, uh, nations that were birthed from uh, Japheth, uh, Tagorma, and then subsequently Ashkenaz, and uh, the Jewish people who occupy Israel today are uh, of Ashkenazim uh, descent, according to their own, uh, what they call themselves, Ashkenazi Jews. We, we talked about uh, a book written by an Ashkenazi Jew uh, called The Thirteenth Tribe, written by author Kessler, where he and his studies came to realize that as an Ashkenazi Jew, he was not a descendant by blood, but rather a descendant by conversion. And they were the Khazarian uh, people who were converted to Judaism. Um, on that note, I want to show you something here. And if I'll put it out on the, I'll put it out on the, uh, in the group so you can see it. I took some time, I'm going to turn my head. Can y'all see this okay? This is, let me make it a little bigger so you can see what you're looking at. So I took some time and went through uh, the table of nations, Genesis 10, and developed sort of a org chart, if you will of the descendants of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Can y'all see that okay? Yes. Okay, all right. So we have Japheth uh, and then his uh, immediate descendants, Gomer, and then the cities that were birthed or the towns or locations that were birthed from these children. So you see Gomer is the father of Galatians, Magog, the Scythians, 
um, a Dai, the Medes, Javan, the Greeks, Tubal, Ibaris, uh, Meshach, uh, Cappadocia. And some of these words may sound familiar to you because you've read them in your New Testament. Um, and then the Thracians, um, uh, Phygians, uh, anyway. And so I did that with all of the descendants of Japheth, Ham and his descendants, Cush, Mizram, Phut, Canaan, and subsequent, uh, and, and then also, and then also what type of languages they spoke, whether or not they spoke Semitic uh, languages or, or not. Um, and as well with, uh, with Shem and his descendants. Let me make this a little smaller so I can see it. Anyway, I felt like this might be a good resource and tool for you guys to have as a, as a reference to look back and say, well, I wonder where the Syrians came from. Oh, they came from Aram who came from Shem, right? Or I wonder where uh, Arabia came from. Well, it's Ish Ishmael and so on and so forth. Um, so I just as a handy reference, um, Mm, that's good, man. That's I, excellent, man. Actually, I think I, I have another one that has all <laughs> the Bible verses. And thank you, by the way, with the Bible verses showing you the reference in scripture. So you'll get you'll get the one with the Bible verses on there so you can refer back to the Bible passages where <laughs> this information came from. All right. Okay. So. Um, so, again, we talked at length about. Um, about Ham and Sham. And so today, we, I'm sorry, Ham and uh, Japheth, excuse me. So today we're going to spend some time with Sham. And because I didn't know how far back to start, um, let, me just, let me just give you some, some general overview of uh, of, of the descendants of Shem. I'm gonna read some information from a book entitled The Ancient Black Hebrews, Abraham and His Family, written by Gert, uh, Gert Mueller. Uh, and I'm gonna, uh, I'll just do, 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 see if I can share my screen with you guys. This. Can y'all see that okay? Whoops. Uh, this is where I was. All right, Abraham's story. I'm just gonna read here. The first clues as to Abraham's ethnic affiliation come from Genesis 11, where we are told about his birth family. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And in fact, let me just read it from here. This is just easier for me to read. Uh, Genesis chapter 10, starting, on, uh, starting in um, verse 21, Genesis 10, 21. <clears throat> Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. The children of Shem, Elam, Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram, and the children of Aram, Uz, and Hul, and Gether, and Mash, and Arphaxad begat Selah, and Selah begat Eber. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. And Joktan begat Almodad, and Shel uh, Shelef, excuse me, and Hazar Maveth and Gerard, and Hadaram, and Uzal, and Dikla, and Ubal, and Abimael, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling was from Misha, as thou goest unto Sephar, a mount of the east. Those are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, and their lands, after their nations. And verse 32 says, and these are the families of Noah, the son uh, of the sons of Noah, after the generations and their nation, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So in continuing to read over here, 
uh, it says that while his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldees in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. And she was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son, Abraham, excuse me, Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife uh, of his son Abram. And together uh, they set forth out of Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. And that is Genesis 11, 27 through 32, read from the NIV. There are two different issues that arise from these verses. First, the significance of the names of Abraham's family and ancestors in identifying his ethnic homeland. Second, the significance of the phrase Ur of the Chaldees and identifying Abraham's place of birth. At this point in our presentation, it is not clear whether his birthplace is necessarily the same as an ethnic homeland. The significance of names. We are told that Terah and his family moved from Ur to Haran on the way to Canaan. But why did they go as far as Haran as opposed to other closer cities in Northwest Mesopotamia? See figure two, which we'll see that in just a second, like Tudal or Tuba. Did they have a pre-existing historical connection with the region around Haran? There's evidence to suggest just that. As scholars have long noted, there is a durable link between Abraham's family and the region of Syro-Mesopotamia between the Euphrates and the Habor rivers around the city of Haran, that is Haran in Akkadian. This is where Abraham's immediate kin lived according to Genesis 11, 31, 24 and 10, 28 to 29, four through five. Abraham's direct ancestors are Terah, his father, Nahor, his grandfather, also the name of Abraham's brother, and Sereg, great-grandfather. Terah and his household come to dwell in Haran, where Terah later dies. All these personal names correspond with place names in the Euphrates-Habor region of, of uh, Syro-Mesopotamia. So in other words, all of these names refer to places on the map. Okay, these place names in various forms are known in texts from the second and first millennium BCE. Nahor, known from old Assyrian and old Babylonian texts, was located east of Haran by the Habor River, Tilsha or Turaha and Sarugi, uh, in the neighborhood of Haran, also known as Nero Assyrian texts. And this is from the book, Remembering Abraham, Culture, Memory, and History in the Hebrew Bible by Ronald Hendel. These corresponding uh, correspondences establish a strong link between Abraham's family, his immediate ancestors, and the area of Northwest Mesopotamia around the Euphrates, Habor. So, uh, it suggests that this area is his ethnic homeland. I think it's important to understand one, something, one thing about the difference between someone's ethnic homeland and where they're born. They can be born someplace, but that place where they're born is not necessarily their ethnic homeland. And so um, as, uh, as Blacks in America, so-called African-Americans, uh, they make reference to, or Mexican-Americans, uh, Italian-Americans, but, it's, but uh, they make reference to a place where they came from as the place of their nativity, as opposed to American suggesting that's where they were they were born. So the place where you're born is not the same as the place where you're uh, the your your ethnic nativity. Okay. All right. I'm not going to read that. I'm going to start reading from my own notes. Mm, just a sec. All right. Abraham, uh, let me start reading here. Nimrod, the grandson of Ham, a Cushite, was the founder of the Babylonian Empire and the first world leader after the flood. 
The world had one language and our leader was a black man. Abraham was called out of this Cushite empire, the place of his birth, Ur of the Chaldees. And Nehemiah 9, 7, thou art the Lord, the God, uh, excuse me, thou art the Lord, the God who didst choose Abram and brought us him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave us him the name of Abraham. That again is Nehemiah 9, 7. Since Abram, since Abraham dwelt among those of the Cushite empire, he was most likely a person of color. Abraham's grandson, Kadar, son of Ishmael, was black. Strong's exhaustive says Kadar from Kadar, dusky of skin, or the tent Kadar, a son of Ishmael, also collectively Bedouin, as his descendants or representatives, Kadar. I'm sorry, I meant to share this so y'all can read along with me. Is that big enough? Can you guys see that? Read that okay? Yes. All right. Kadar, a primitive root to be ashy, i.e. dark colored by implication to mourn in sackcloth or sorted garments, be black-ish, be, uh, be or make dark or darken, heavily cause to, uh, cause to mourn. So that's what Kadar means. That's from Strong's Exhaustive. Abraham's grandson is named Kadar, and Kadar means black. Abraham and Hagar, and Hagar, an Egyptian, had Ishmael. Kadar means dark color, so then this is further evidence that Abraham had an African complexion. Uh, so Abraham sent his servant to the land of his birth, the Cushite Empire mentioned above, to get a wife for his son Isaac. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac in Genesis 24, 2 through 4. Uh, because Abraham knew the Canaanites were cursed uh, and the most I promised to give him the land, uh, give him uh that promised to give him and his seat their land. And he said, cursed be Canaan. So um, Genesis 9, 25, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. And he, and he said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem and Canaan shall be a servant. God shall enlarge Japheth and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. Again, that's Genesis 9, 25 through 27. Um, this, this verse is a verse that a lot of biblical scholars have used to suggest that the black uh, race of people are, are cursed. And um, that's just a bit dishonest. Uh, this passage does clearly show a curse, but the curse is not to an ethnos, it's to a lineage. And it's specifically the lineage of Canaan, right? So he told, he said that Canaan was gonna be cursed um, and not all blacks, as uh, as I've heard. I'm not sure if you guys have heard that before, uh, but I have heard that in theological circles that uh, the black race is cursed, and that, which is why they went into perpetual slavery, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but this curse here was for Canaan, that he would be the servant of both Shem and Japheth. So Abraham wanted to ensure Isaac's wife did not come from among the people he dwelt among, but from his relatives that dwelt in the land of Mesopotamia. And the servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed for all the, and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. Nahor should be familiar because we saw him in the line of Shem. All right. So this is a map of Mesopotamia by the Levant uh, and the Levant by author Atar Aram. And it is from the Creative Commons website. One of the questions that was asked was uh, about uh, his, uh, well, we'll talk about, we'll get, we'll get there, but we're talking about Abraham's uh, ethnic descent. We know that he came from Ur the Chaldees, and Ur was a city that was established by 
a Kushite, uh, by, uh, the uh, Babylonian Empire was a Kushite Empire. And that is where Abraham was from, Ur of the Chaldees. To get a better understanding of why this is important, I will take excerpts again from the ancient Black Hebrews, Abraham and his family. Ur of the Chaldees, the city of Ur. I have a question. I'm sorry. Yes. So, okay. So since that, that topic of, you know, that Black people are, were the curse or will get the curse. And so how do you prove that it's, that's more about the lineage of uh, Canaan than, like, how will you disprove the people that say, hey, no, it's all Black people? Right, and that's a great question. So give me a second and I'll show it to you. Okay. Uh, All right. So in Genesis chapter nine, I'm gonna start reading in verse 18. Um, and the sons of Noah, can y'all see that? Can you read, can you see that? Okay. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah. And out of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be a husband, planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine in verse 21 and was drunk and uncovered in his tent. Verse 22, and Ham, the father of Canaan, uh, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backwards and they saw not the nakedness of their, they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him and said, cursed be Ham and all of Ham's descendants. So we know that Ham is the father of all the dark races, but he didn't curse Ham. He cursed Canaan. Okay. Only Canaan. So didn't curse him. He cursed Canaan. Okay. Now Canaan is the is a descendant of Ham. Ham had four sons. Mm -hmm. Um uh, Mizram, which is Egypt, uh, Phut, which is Libya, Cush, which is Ethiopia, and Canaan. Okay. So he so did how, how will you distinguish? like the people of uh, Canaan, Canaan versus um, like the other descendants of Ham. That's the thing. So uh, they dwelt in a particular area. So all of Genesis 10 is uh, what's commonly referred to as the table of nations. Mm -hmm. Give me a second, I'll pull up another map. You had up, right? Excuse me? The chart that you had up that you showed us earlier. Yeah, but I'm gonna show you this on a map. I want, I want you to see what that looks like on a map because it's important to understand uh, that the nation of Ham did not, was not limited to just the, uh, what is commonly referred to as Africa today. So the, so the nation of Ham is not limited to the, to the continent that is commonly called Africa. So let me show you that. So it's spilled over to other areas, and then Canaan is just going to be a small part of that. And Canaan is that spillover. I just want to make okay. sure I show it to you on the map, so to make this very clear. Uh, I was just asking because if you if we have people that think that you know the whole black race was cursed or is cursed. And how do you prove that, hey, no, it's not all of, um, like all right. of the descendants of Ham, so. Right, but it's only the descendants of Canaan and it's, okay. and it's not uh, all, it's not the descendants of, of, okay, Ham. of Ham. So let me, I'm gonna show you two things. I think I can do it this way here, share. Okay, you should see two maps or a bunch of stuff, but two maps is what I wanna show you. Well, 
All right, so this yellow area is the African plate and it stretches all the way up to the, to the Arabian Eurasian plate here. You see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. This stretch of land right here is the land of Canaan. Okay. So let me show you a different, another way. This stretch of land, oops. This stretch of land right here is the land of Canaan. Okay. So Syria, Jordan, that area. All of that is the okay. land of Canaan. And the land of Canaan was was inhabited by a specific people group, which the land, the um, the, the the table of nations sort of uh, org chart that I prepared will mm -hmm. show you all of those different people groups. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But it is it is not Ham's descendants. It is only Canaan. Okay. Mm -hmm. Only Canaan. Hey y'all. Pastor Stacy, Pastor Don. All right. Um, what about, does that include, that's the Hebrews in Canaan? So that's a great question. Now, what God told Abraham is that he is going to give him that land. He was going to give him that land. And his, uh, his descendants would occupy that land. Now, he didn't realize the blessing. He had, he had died uh, long before the children of Israel uh, went into the land of Canaan. So then you, if you remember, uh, after they left Egypt, um, they took a very long route, a 40-year route, to get to the land of Canaan, where they were given instructions to dispossess the inhabitants of the land. Mm -hmm. okay um unfortunately they didn't believe god right mm -hmm. so they believe they believed in god they just didn't believe god and so it took them 40 years to make an 11 day journey mm -hmm. and on the 40th year according to hebrews chapter 3 they entered in uh and uh so so the it the hebrews were to were to kill the inhabitants of the land of Canaan mm -hmm. with prejudice, kill them all. But that didn't happen. No, they need to. So they decide to save some alive, some others uh, tricked them into uh, not killing them. <laughs> um, they wanted a king. They, uh, they put uh, Saul in place. Saul was given instructions by the prophet go and utterly slay all the Amalekites. The Amalekites are descendants of Canaan. Utterly slay them, everything. If it breeds, kill it. And he kept the sheep alive and the king, right? Adding to his disobedience. <clears throat> My point is, is that over and over and over where God has given us instructions to do things. And, well, let me, and, 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 excuse me, let me say this way here. Where God has given Hebrews instructions to do things, uh, they have been overwhelmingly disobedient. They have been very, very rebellious. They um, have, as a people group, they have not obeyed the Lord. So every time God would tell them to do something, they would disobey. Do this, and they would do the opposite. Uh, so in the case of the land of Canaan, where they were the first time they went up, to spy out the land, the scripture says that they brought back grapes. I don't know, a grape, a cluster, a single cluster of grapes. How many y'all eat? Y'all eat grapes? Yes. Okay. yes. All right. So they brought back a cluster of grapes, just one. And the cluster was as such that had to be carried on a stick between two men. When I go buy grapes from Walmart, they don't come that big. Mm -hmm. Walmart grapes, little tiny things. This land is a land overflowing with milk and honey, with vineyards they didn't plant, with houses they didn't build. And they only had one thing to do. All they had to do was go onto the land and get the people off of there. But you see, when they got there, they saw, they saw giants. Mm -hmm. And they were giants, okay? So I'm not going to minimize their stature. They were some big folk. Uh, 
hence when I said that they believed in God, they just didn't believe God. They didn't believe that God was going to give them the power to overcome those giants and to take possession of the land. Only two people believe that, Mother Wanda, just two, Joshua and Caleb, which is why they spent 40 years in the wilderness. So that generation, that is Joshua and Caleb's generation would die. And so that Joshua and Caleb uh, would, uh, would uh, lead them into the promised land 40 years later. So the point is, is that Canaan is part of the African nation the country of Africa. Canaan is a descendant of Ham, and it was a people group that was despised by the Lord. Uh, I have some theories about why they were despised, uh, but they were a despised people. Uh, so much so that God told the descendants of Abraham, the children of Israel, to go in there and utterly, that is with prejudice, kill every, everything there. And they did not do that. So that's how, that's part of, that's part of, that's all part of the curse of Canaan. And that curse that was levied out to Canaan does not impact all people of color. It only impacts Canaanites. There's a, there's a couple of videos that, that were put out there on the group, one of which was called uh, Hebrews to Negroes. And in the video, they talked about uh, some of the descendants of the Canaanites that still exist today. Um, as they're the, the pygmy people. At least this particular, this particular uh, person thinks that pygmies are descendants of the Canaanites, which is kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy, right? A lot, of the, a lot of the Canaanites were really tall and have pygmies that are kind of small in stature. Nevertheless, Canaanite was the object of the curse. So, so you're telling us, Lewis, that Noah cursed a future grandson and his people, basically. Yes. Yes. And, and I didn't say that. And that's, Ham, what, that's what the scripture says. And Ham knew that when he was naming his children, too. That. So I think it could be argued that Canaan was already born. Okay. So it's interesting that he picked one of his grandchildren to curse. Right. I have a theory about that. When God asked uh, to call the people the stiff-necked people, were that were they the Hebrews? They were the Hebrews. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. know what, you know what stiff neck means? <laughs> any, any of you guys ever rode a horse before or tried to lead a horse? Yeah, or donkey yeah. or mule, mm -hmm. same yeah. thing. Yeah. So yeah. When, when that horse does this number here, when you're pulling them and he does this, that's stiff neck. So you're pulling yeah. them in one direction and that's stubborn. Stiff, that's stiff, stubborn. Mm -hmm. But I like the analogy of stiff neck in a horse because uh, it's, so, it's so vivid. I used to have a horse and I'm like, come on, star, come on. And that was just mm -hmm. yank me around because it's so strong. Yeah. Um, but stiff neck. Mm -hmm. And now, hard, hard, hard. Go ahead, Pastor. Well, I was going to say, so now the justification, so Tanika, to your point, your question, the, it, they used, they being um, colonizers, and you know, they used it as justification to enslave Black people, right? Mm -hmm. the, their interpretation of this curse, um, that all the black race would be enslaved. And the thing is, God doesn't need, God doesn't need our help. And so if, if there's a curse that's pronounced by, uh, by Noah, um, it kind of goes back to what I said on Sunday, that for whatever reason, we in the Western world, and I'll, I'll just include all of us, we've kind of arrived at a place to where we think our form of Christianity is the best model of Christianity for the world. Right. And, 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 and they're not, do, they're not doing it right over in wherever. India and in Africa and wherever. Um, and it's our job to go into spread our brand of Christianity. Well, that mindset um, 
this flawed interpretation, they felt as if it's their job to make sure that this piece of scripture is fulfilled um, and, and that they contribute to the fulfillment of it. You know what I mean? And so, and it's a flaw, it's just flawed all the way around, right? And But they used it and they preached it and they taught it. And I'm going to look further than that. Criswell, um, one of the reasons why I left Criswell College years ago is um, I had no idea. I had some brothers, some, some, some black brothers of mine that were like, you attend Criswell? I said, yeah, I attend Criswell College. And they said, you didn't know, you didn't know about Criswell? And I said, I had no idea. Um, they, well, they showed me some information that Criswell was an outspoken white supremacist. And so much so that Criswell, he had uh, uh, a Ku Klux Klan robes hanging in his office. This is Criswell, the, 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 um, the founder, the, the founder of First Baptist Dallas. And, and I found the video. There's a video where Criswell was preaching segregation. I mean, passionately. Blacks and whites shouldn't be together. And da 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 da. He's preaching. Now, prior to him passing, Criswell repented of that. Okay. He repented publicly from the pulpit prior to him passing. Um, but this, this is this is what this was rooted like a foundational belief of Southern Baptists and Southern uh, uh, Christians, you know, you know you know, throughout the United States that we were to be the oppressed people and it was their job to do it. So, so anyway, flaw belief system, flaw belief system. Oh, wow, wow. Uh, to add to that, there was a video that's out there in, in our group space. Uh, I'm trying to get to it, to give you the title resources. The video is titled How Socialized Rewrote Civil War History. Mm -hmm. And it goes through and it talks about some of the um, propaganda that was that was put in the school system. So the public education system and some of the information that was taught to rewrite Southern history to in favor of the South. So. All right. So the time is 751. Uh, let me pause here and uh, there's a, a, a few, a little bit more content to cover about Abraham's birthplace, his complexion, and, and that's where I was trying to go with, with tonight's, with tonight's uh, study, is just to demonstrate that, uh, that Abraham came from a Kushite empire and so Cush is the son of Ham, and so he would have a complexion that's not European. Elder? Yes. I have a quick question, sir. You, right. you mentioned, uh, I, I believe somebody had mentioned numerous times, you and somebody else, about the Noah curse. What, I, I know I'm, I'm like 15 minutes late. No, you're fine. This, but I just, I just want scripture. So I can jot it down and I can go back on my accord and and read up on that because I, I, I know I don't recall a Noah curse. So oh. and again, that doesn't mean I no, it's all I'm not saying that didn't happen. I just want to know for reference. It's Genesis 9, 18 and following. What is it again, sir? Genesis 9, starting in verse 18 and following. Where Noah cursed his grandson Canaan. Yes, sir. Ham looked upon his nakedness. Okay. okay, thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right. Um, let me let me start here. Are you guys okay with going over um, about 20 minutes? Are good. All right. The city of Ur is always called in Genesis Ur of the Chaldees as if the phrase preserves an important memory. Ur was one of the southernmost cities of Mesopotamia. The Chaldees were the politically dominant ethnic group in Babylon and Babylonia when the Genesis sources were written in 7th century BC. 
Chaldeans were not present in this region before 1000 BC, excuse me, BC and appear to be a glaring anachronism in the time of Abraham, which is circa 1800 BC. And anachronism is something that is placed in a period earlier or later than its actual time. What is the relationship between Abraham's birthplace of Ur the Chaldees and his ethnic homeland, the Euphrates Habor region? Um, most writers who argued that Abraham was black did so on the basis of Ur being part of the region founded by Nimrod, son of Cush. But this is only a valid argument if Abraham was indigenous to Ur or that region. Being born somewhere does not necessarily mean that that one is indigenous to that place. The other population of Babel, uh, the other population of Babylonia, the Amorites, were semi-nomadic. The Amorites did not originate in, Bab in Babylonia, but in the Syrian desert. The first mention in connection with the Jabal Bishri region, they spread throughout Syria. Uh, where they formed the state of Yamad, North Mesopotamia, where they were centered around the city of Marai and South Mesopotamia, where they took over Ur and founded Babylon. They also took Excuse over me, the- okay. I'm sorry, can you share your screen again? Oh, certainly, certainly. Da, 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 da. I didn't want to stop you, thank you. Oh, no, you're good. Um, it helps me actually write out the words. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, ancient civilizations, <laughs> ancient civilizations. That's not it. Ancient civilizations. There we go. Share. Get over here. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, is it up? Okay. This is where we are. They spread throughout Syria where they formed the state of Yamad, as we already read. They also took over the coast. I don't uh, see it. I don't, I see, don't it. see Dr. Gills. Oh, no. All right, black. I lost you guys. Sorry. There we go. Is that there good? Is. I wonder why yeah, it's not. Yeah. There it is. Oh, there okay. it is. I see it. Okay. Very good. Very good. Very good. All right. They also took over the coast of northern Canaan, which later became known as Amuru. The Amorites became the politically dominant uh, population in the Feral Crescent the area formed by Babylonia, Northwest Mesopotamia and Canaan. This is significant because Genesis 11, 31 through 32 told us that Terah took his family from Ur south and traveled to Haran north with the intent to reach Canaan. This journey was along the same fertile crescent that was Amorite ruled. Uh, the early presence of the Amorites in Northwest Mesopotamia locates them in the region we have already identified as the most likely ethnic homeland of Abraham. This explains the link between Abraham's birthplace, Ur, and his likely ethnicity, Northwest Mesopotamia. It is also clear from Genesis 12 a that Abraham and his people were familiar with tents, which is what we would expect of semi-nomads. All right, that again was a quote from Gert Mueller's book. Uh, the issue with the Amorite theory is, according to Genesis 10, they are descendants of Ham, while Hebrews are descendants of Shem. This should not present an issue once you consider that the genealogies presented in Genesis 10 are more about geographical location rather than ethnic descent. Mueller goes on to say that Havilah, who was a son of Cush in Genesis 10, 6, and also given as a son of Joktan, son of Eber in Genesis 10, verse 29, Joktan's descendants stretched from Misha unto Sephar, Genesis 10.30, see figure three. In both instances, the link between the line of Cush and the line of Eber, uh, in both instances, there is a link between the lines. Conclusion, Hamite and Shemite categories cannot be about ethnic descent and certainly cannot be about complexion. All right, again, here is the uh, figure three that he was making reference to. All right, let's keep going. And this will be out on the group as a resource. Archaeological evidence shows that in the area in which Genesis places Abraham, the population on both sides of the Red Sea were culturally related. When we look at the tectonic plate of the old world, we can see the African plate, the Arabian plate, the Eurasian plate have a striking correspondence to the nations of Ham, Shem, and Japheth, more so than does Africa, Southwest Asia, and Eurasia. This is the map that I showed you earlier, okay? So in other words, uh, uh, let's keep reading. A picture's worth a thousand words. 
to wrap our minds around something, uh, sometimes it's hard to wrap our minds around something unless we can see some sort of pictorial evidence, something that demonstrates what is being said in pictures and images. Let's take a few uh, Im looks at some images below. So I'm gonna skip this one. Figure eight, priest of Baal at Dura Europa, uh, Europa Syria 250 AD, a dark brown adult and a very dark brown adolescent Kushan. Even 2000 years after Abraham, there were still Kushans in the region, uh, the in Syria, that region, okay? A dark brown African complexion Amorite soldier. Again, the Amorites are from, if you'll let me show you here, the Amorites are from, generally from this region here on the map, Arabian plate, okay? So he's showing us that these Amorites have a complexion that is very similar to Africans, although they are not Africans. An Assyrian soldier is about to dispatch an Armenian nomad. Complexion is one of the defining characteristics, contrasts, excuse me, between Assyrians and Armenians. We can see the hands of another Armenian and Assyrian showing the same distinction. Armenian, Assyrian. So what was Abraham by ethnicity? Abraham was an Amorite from the Euphrates Habor region, a descendant of Shem by location. They were the ancestors of the Armenians. The Elamites, also descendants from Shem by location, were of African appearance. A later king of Abraham's homeland is likened to the people of Cush, as is Moses' Midianite wife and the Midianites in general. This would be this would only be sensible if the people of Aram Neharam were of African complexion in general. There are images of Amorites contemporary with Abraham with dark as well as standard African complexions. Even images from a thousand years later contrast the brown uh, Amor uh, Arameans with the pale of the Assyrians. All of this makes it clear that Abraham had an African complexion. It should also be said for the purpose of the research of this book, the Old Testament is consistent. We often hear about the Bible contradicting itself on the point of the Midianites having a Cushite association. It is consistent. On the point of the uh, Arameans, including Abraham, having a Cushite association, it is consistent. Genesis and the Israelites are not only associated with advanced scientific knowledge, but we find that both Ham and Shem correspond to the African and Arabian plates, uh, plates respectively. This is obvious when you compare a map showing Ham's extension into Asia and Shem's extension out of Arabia with a tectonic map. This is a parallel of the advanced scientific knowledge Genesis shows when it accurately locates the origin of humanity in Ethiopia. Almost no other bi biblical scholars have ever pointed this out or sought to explain this. Again, that was from uh, uh, Mueller's book, The Ancient Black Hebrews. Okay, so this is just the beginning of our study on Shem. So there is a lot more to come uh, for Shem, but to recap, Shem uh, is the, I think Shem is the youngest son of Noah. Shem uh, corresponds to the, uh, generally speaking, the uh, uh, Northwest Mesopotamian area. The people who uh, live, or uh, native indigenous to that area share the same complexion as Hamites. And the only point tonight was to demonstrate that Shemites and Hamites share a similar complexion. All right. All right. So I ask this question. I ask this question every week of everybody. Um, it, is, it, is anybody struggling with this content? Is it? Is it? Um, 
is it an intellectual battle to accept what's being taught? For anybody? Is it like, I don't get this. I don't, I don't, I, you know, I'm not quite there, Pastor Bynum, that these people were black people. Is that, is it an intellectual battle to, to accept that? No. Okay. Um, I guess it would be easier. Certainly for me, it would be easier if Lewis could point to a, a certain space of time and say, this is when the intermingling started happening and people started getting lighter skin. You know what I mean? But it, it was such a gradual, it was such a gradual thing that, that stiff neckedness that Lewis was talking about, you know, God kept telling him, he kept telling him, Hey, I don't need you marrying into this group, marrying into that group. I don't need you doing that. And it, it was written. And really what God was saying is a spiritual consequence for it. To like the idolatry. Is that idolatry. Absolutely. Yeah. The idolatry. Yeah. But in addition to that, God knew that they would completely lose themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And going back, Clondra last week, she said, we've last week, she said, you know, well, what does it matter? And that's been ringing in my head, Calandria, actually, for all week. And does anyone have that same sentiment? What does it matter? What does it matter? Does anyone feel like that? And I, and I apologize because I wasn't here last week, but you're talking about what is what does it matter in regards to what? What does it matter? Their, their what? what what their complexion was. What does it matter whether or not Abraham was black or Noah or Nimrod or what does it matter? What, 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 you know, the new Testament, the disciples, whether or not Paul was black, what, what does it matter? I mean, and that was Calandria. She brought that point up. Does anyone else feel that way? To some extent? Yes. I had that like, question when I, we first started, it's like, okay, you know, Right. Yeah, same question. And Adam, I think you did you freeze out? Yes, sir. No, I, I said to some extent, yes, that's been in the back of my mind. And I guess for for me, for just I mean, I, and I'm just being transparent. Is, sure. Aren't we just supposed to be preaching the love of God and, and sharing Jesus to the people and trying to get people saved in these last times and these end of times? Um, so to speak, as to get as many stones on your crown as possible. I mean, if, 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 is that really going to? I understand. You know, and I'm not trying to step on any toes, but is that no, really no. going to help our cause into the kingdom of heaven? Is that going to advance the kingdom? Um, yes, it's really good knowledge based information, absolutely. Uh, where it all started from and how it, how it all and 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 i can just go just a little bit further yeah you can't appreciate where you are until you appreciate where you've come from and where you've been you know you can't appreciate your now if you don't know your i unmute i stay y'all are muted Did you catch anything? Or? Yes, we did. You can't we did. Your, you can't understand your now unless you understand your past. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, yes, to some extent, that's 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 been in my mind. Like, what does that matter, kingdom wise, kingdom related? You know, right. um, it, you know, and that it's just just being honest. Just, no, that's good stuff. Go ahead, Louis. I was just gonna. I was just gonna ask. Um, Who 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 are the who are the natural people of God? Who are the what people group that God set aside as His own? Uh, the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jews, the Jews. Hebrews, that's right. And so then, let me ask another question: uh, Where are they on the earth? They're scattered. Uh, everywhere. So they're scattered amongst the world, and uh, but. The pre predominant location we could say would be Israel, Jerusalem, 
And so there's a Bible passage that says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that bless thee. And so if we're praying for the peace of a people group who have stolen the identity of another people group, how, how are you getting the prosperity that was promised to you for the prayer? You're asking a why. Why is this important? And so God has, has set aside the Hebrew people as a peculiar people. I like the word peculiar. We think peculiar means weird, but peculiar does not mean weird. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, so uh, this is my phone, and on my phone is a case. This case is peculiar to the phone. That is to say, it is made for the phone, peculiar. And so there's a people group who are peculiar to God, right? And those people uh, have an identity, and we're asked, we're called to as New Testament <laughs> believers to pray for them. And if you don't know who them are, where them are, or you've mis uh, misapplied who they may be, then you're not going to be the recipient of the said blessing that God has promised you for the, for the prayer. That's just one. Uh, why uh, does it matter? Two, if it didn't matter, if this is true and it doesn't matter, then why did they change it? Right? So why go through all the effort to make the change if this is true and it doesn't matter? Because to some extent, to some people, this does in fact, matter. How does it advance the kingdom? Well, part of understanding or having a kingdom mentality is to understand where you are in prophecy. The Lord rebuked the Pharisees because they could discern the face of the sky, but they could not discern the sign of the times. I don't want us to be to be in that same number. So the sum of last day's prophecy centers around the Jews. Yeah. So Adam, and let me say this, and I, I and I, it, this is important, so important. This is probably one of the most important questions or sentiments that has been raised that Kalandra raised last week, because, okay, truth is what, truth is essential, right? And so if we're not presenting the Bible in its to, in in its uh, totality. Yeah. And, and authenticity and and the and the the, uh, the total truth yeah. of God's word, what? then we're Everybody if we change just a little bit, it makes it a lie. If we change it just a little bit, it makes it a lie. That's right. And so I want to zero in on, on one passage of scripture. Uh everybody, if you can, go back. Lewis has talked about it, but go to go to Revelations 2 and 9. I just want to, I want to let's go to Revelations 2 and 9. Because, you know, Limitless Church or the house of the truth built, right? We're just going we to stand flat foot on the word of God because this is so important. And I don't really know. I don't, it's, not on me to, it's not on me to figure out how to fix it. Okay. But it is our responsibility to present the truth. Okay. So when you look at Revelations 2 and 9, and it, it talks about, well, and unto the angel of the church 28 of Smyrna, write these things, said uh, the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Um, the the Bible is very clear that there are people that are claiming to be something that they're not. And the reason why these people are claiming to be something that they're not, they were st strategically placed in that region for the purpose of protecting white interest. Hear me very clearly. These people were strategically placed in that region for the purpose of protecting white interest in that region. What I mean, right, white, it's a stronghold. The United States of America, the partnership with Israel, it creates uh, a territory where we can operate militarily, so on and so forth. We did the same thing up in uh, the different regions of, uh, around Russia, right, to where we, um, um, we created these strongholds to protect the interests of the United States of America. Okay. These people, I believe, 
even thus far in um, in the lecture series of what Lewis has presented, I believe the evidence is indisputable that these white people are not the original Jews. These are white people in Africa. And I'm just asking you to just 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 draw upon common sense. These are white people in Africa. These are these are literally white people. The cancer, the skin cancer rate in Israel is the highest in the world because these are white people and they are not um, indigenous in, indigenous and 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 they can't bear the climate of that region, right? And so 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 I think the evidence is there. But as to the why, think about this, y'all. Let's say that one of us on this call, that we are a direct descendant of Israel. We are the root of Israel. You don't have a clue who you are. You don't have a clue who you are because all that was stolen from you. Don't blame them. Don't blame the white man. Blame your ancestors. Blame the people that rebelled against God. Blame the stick, the stiff neck, stiff neck people. Those are, that's, that was your grandmama. That was your, that was your great, 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 great. They were stiff neck people, idolatrous people. And as a result of their idolatry, you don't even know who you are. Amen. Now, here's, here's the significance of this. The Bible clearly says that there, there has to be an awakening that takes place amongst these dispersed people in order to usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the significance. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to talk about kingdom, kingdom is we got to preach the truth. We, and I, it ain't, it, you know, I struggled with this. Is it our job, Limitless Church? We can't, we can't fix it, but here's what we can do. We can say, hey, you know what? These people were black people. Over the course of time, the region and the complexion of people changed. The dispersed Jews, they ended up in this part of the world. They ended up in this part of the world. They ended up in this part of the world. Not only that, they forgot their worship. They forgot the God that they worship. They forgot who they were. And now they're just all over the place. There's all over the place. And, but if, if those people that have lost a sense of who they are and, and had no idea who they were, if they turn back to God and say, Father, we repent, that, that wave of, of repentance has to take place in order to usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. This stuff has to happen. I said this on Sunday, I'm a, and I'm going to shut up, Bruce. I said this on Sunday, that the whole notion is ridiculous. The whole notion that the way we do church here in the United States is the best in the world. And, and we've got to go over to Iraq, the Middle East, and we've got to convert them and we've got to preach Jesus to them. We've got to preach Jesus to, to India. We've got to preach Jesus to Asia. We've got to preach Jesus. Let me tell you something. Revival is breaking out in those areas. Mm -hmm. There are people coming to Christ left and right in Asia, in India, in the Middle East. There are people that are coming to Christ. And, and, and watch this. And the word is being preached unadulterated. Now, I said this on Sunday. The divorce rate over in, in, um, in some of those countries is 1%, 2%. The divorce rate over here in the United States of America is over to 60-something percent. Right. And we, and we want to preach our version of Jesus to them. Listen, over in those countries, um, uh, whether you agree with it or not, you know, homosexuality and that type of behavior is condemned. It is, it is, it, it's condemned. And you come over here in our churches and many of our churches accept that stuff. And we think the way we do Christianity is the best model to do Christianity. And we've watered it. That's why, that's why the church is shrinking here in the United States of America. God has given us, God is saying, Hey, God is saying, Hey, turn, turn back to me. The church is shrinking here. That We are an idolatrous nation. We are an idolatrous nation, and revival is spreading elsewhere. So why it's important? Because this truth has to be preached in order to usher in the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
And there needs to be an awakening across the world. There are people, not just black people. There are people, there are people, melanated people in India that lost their way. There are melanated people in South America that lost their way. There are, there are, there are Native American people. There are many, I mean, there are many variations of these things that have lost their way. And, and every one of those people groups drank the Euro, Eurocentric theology Kool-Aid that, that told them that Jesus was blonde-haired and blue-eyed. And that the disciples were blonde-haired and blue-eyed. And that all good comes from blonde-haired and blue-eyed people. And as a result, you had uh, people of color, not just black people, trying to be white, Hispanics trying to be white, because we were made to believe that that's the standard. If you do a Google search for the word beautiful, you will see pages and pages and pages of white women. No women of color. So it's, 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 it's deep. And I knew the sentiment exists and I, I'm not, uh, I'm a little passionate about it. I hope y'all don't think I'm fussing. I am, oh. I'm simply saying we're going to tell the truth. It's, it's not our job to determine the outcome. Does that make sense? Yeah. Go ahead, first lady. You, you want to say something? Tell the truth, but we have to be able to to say it the right way, to be able to explain it, um, where that people will understand. Because it's 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 gonna be it, it's gonna be different. I, I, I people are thinking this stuff. I know they think, but no one no one is actually vocal about saying it. So, because the last thing, the last thing we want, First Lady and Elder and Pastor, is an us versus them mentality. Right, but you know that's what? That's the last the, thing we want too. The the Lord did tell us that as we go further and deeper in the truth, that truth would naturally begin to separate people. Right, mm -hmm. and so then yeah. it'll be it'll be husbands against wives, uh, children against parents. And if that's going to happen in a person's home who is standing on the truth, then we should, uh, by extension, see that in area in other areas of our lives. Truth right. is a is a point of division. It will divide. It will yeah. divide, um, Adon. It will divide when truth is presented. Yeah. And there's a video. I'm going to send it to you, Adon. Um, you know, after you unwind and, and kick back in your recliner, I want you to watch it. Lewis and I watched, spent about an hour and a half watching it last week. I, I, I believe it was last week, wasn't it, Lewis? It was last week, yeah. All right. I put it and out there, I think. It's in the resource. Is it, is it in the resources? Okay, so there's a video in the resources y'all need to watch. It is a rabbi. Yeah, saving, uh, no, it's called uh, Prophetic Statement for Both Africans and African Americans. And this comes from a Jewish rabbi. He is a Jewish rabbi. And this man begins to speak prophetically. And he, and he said there was an awakening, to paraphrase, that, that took place right around the time of George Floyd and so on and so forth. And it was a major Jewish holiday that, that took place, an observance that took place around the same time. Right. And he said there's just a wave of awakening that's taking place. This Jewish rabbi. Now, and he clearly says, he's speaking directly to, he said, I've never spoken to Africans. Nor, nor have I spoken to uh, North Americans, those that are in the United States. He said, but I want to speak to black people in the United States, and I want to speak to Africa. You are of the root of Israel. That's what he said. You are of the root of Israel. And he goes on for an hour and a half. Yeah. And he said, you are of the root of Israel. And, and, he, and he lays it out. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that, that's the type of, and this only happened within the past six months. So that's the type of an awakening that's going on right now um, globally throughout the world to where not only are we waking up to, um, and, and I guess even walking in more boldness and courage to even present the truth. Just It's just the truth. It's just right here. It's like, you can't argue with it. It's here it is, right? But you have you have the nation of Israel that's also acknowledging that, hey, guess what? Um, we haven't done right, nor have we presented this truth right. And now he said something. Now, there are some little areas in there that, that we disagree with because he said 
he feels like um, we're we're all Jewish or is uh, Hebrew brothers and sisters, and we we in order to usher in um, uh, the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that this awakening has to be, and this this uh, acknowledgement has to be amongst all Hebrew brothers and sisters. He includes himself in that. Yeah. Now, the last thing I'm gonna say. I keep saying the last thing. I don't believe that the, those white Jewish converts in Israel, Adon, are evil people. No. I believe that they are Jewish converts. Yes. Okay. And and many of them believe with their whole heart in what they do and, and in the God that they worship. But I do believe that there are some elders in Israel that know the truth. Okay. Um, and that's why they ushered in in the 70s, those Ethiopian, uh, those Ethiopian Jews that were direct descendants of Solomon and, and, and the Queen of Sheba, because they, they couldn't argue with that because the evidence existed in Ethiopia. That's what I'm saying. We have to be very evident based. I mean, we got to show it, you know, be able to, if you're going to bring this thing to pass and say these things. You got to have it. We got to have it together. <laughs> and it's not the sum total. And guess what? So don't worry. This isn't the sum total of who Limitless Church is. We don't know. Oh, we ain't going to just get up there and start preaching this. But guess what? We got to present the truth. Uh, cool. I'm just going to give you some evidence just real quick of what uh, Pastor said earlier. This is a letter between uh, author James Balfour and uh, uh, and the Roth, Lord Rothschild. Rothschild. I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government uh, view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object it being clearly understood that nothing should be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in, uh, in any other country. Now, uh, this is commonly called the Balfour Declaration. Uh, author James Balfour, former British prime minister, uh, issued this declaration in 1917. Right, which stated their, uh, the uh, support of the state of Palestine. This was, uh, I'm trying to find the actual words, um, but essentially this uh, support was a strategic political endeavor. And it says so, and I'll put this out there. It was a political strategic endeavor uh, because it would give them a place, uh, an ally in a region of the world in the event they needed to, well, need an ally in that part of the world. Here we go. And long term, the motive behind British policy rests on the importance of Palestine as a strategic point on the land and sea routes to India and above, uh, and above all, as the uh, terminus at the Mediterranean Sea of pipelines for the rich oil bearing regions of the Middle East. This is from CIA.gov, by the way. So do y'all do y'all see that? That's from CIA.gov. That's our government agency. So they established that Jewish state. They moved. They strategically moved those the, the white Jewish converts into that region for the purpose of protecting white interest. Yes. And this is this comes from the British Prime Minister. Yes. Okay. Um, a lot of information to take on. It, it, it is a lot of information, and I'm, we're trying to disseminate. Mm -hmm. uh, my attempt is to disseminate years of study into into eight, mm -hmm. essentially eight hours, <laughs> which is an impossible task. Ooh. I do want to show you one other something because it will make this point uh, just overwhelmingly clear. Uh, the other thing that Pastor mentioned was the hot part of the world. So if you can see that, you see this? This is a map, Google, this is just Google Maps, right? Huh. 
Now, this area here, this area is burning up. There's no grass growing here. It's, this is the hottest part of the world, right here. This little spot right here, that's Israel. Israel. The people who occupy the land are not indigenous to this region. They're indigenous to a region that's a lot cooler up here, which is why the cancer, uh, the skin, the melanoma rate is so high in that area because you have an entire group of people living there that don't belong there. Um, so I want to make a comment. So uh, Pastor, I know you said not to be like upset at certain people, but as you study, like I said, it's, it's very emotional for me, right? So, but as you study and like, it's one, it's literally in the Bible, like the Bible that we all read day in and day out. And so when you go to church for all these years, we've been, we get these feel good messages, right? Like, hey, um, it's, uh, you know, you're going through this and God's going to carry you through. So you hear these feel good messages or motivating uh, messages, like a good portion of your life. So then you come to a church that teaches about the principles in the actual Bible and now actually reading the Bible, like really reading and putting it together, it's emotional, right? And so then you go back and you actually just read the truth like right in front of you that we've all had in our hands forever. Mm -hmm. And it, it's hard not to be angry, you know, like the deception. And then when you think about history and you think about social studies, like when you were in grade school and high school, and you think about the things you were taught and the projects that you did, you've done, you know, like, hey, this is American history and, and all these things. And then now I'm 40 years, I'm 40 years old. And I'm like, like that wasn't like a relearning. It's like, you're just, you're yeah, just, like, and it's, a, it's just a lot. It's mind blowing. It's every day. Information. Yeah. And it's like, I'm reading something, but then it's hard for me not to get angry, especially if we're, I'm, you're reading a letter where they intentionally planted these people in this land for their benefit. And that's like what occurs day in and day out here. Mm. You know, we put certain people in political office so that it benefits, you know, us or whoever it is. Or we place certain people on boards and certain things in companies for our, you know, for the best interest. Sure, benefit, benefit. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, it's still occurring. And so it's hard not to be angry because these are the things that we see day in and day out on top of what, is you know that actually occurred and happened. So that's just no, my I, mean, I, just, I just process it, and it's like when you say, "Don't be angry, be angry at our." Well, I, 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 what I'm saying is, uh, I, okay. So I've, I've experienced your emotions. So let me acknowledge that I've had I've experienced your emotions. But if um, you posted many times that you're a daddy's girl, I've seen your posts that you're about your daddy, right? So what if you knew that your daddy was a, that just prior to you being born, that your daddy was a billionaire? And what if you knew that he squandered it and, and he was stiff necked and he just, you know, who would you be mad at? Right. That he, yeah. you understand. I'm, so I'm, yeah, you, you, you'd have to confront daddy. Mm hmm. And you'd have to say, Daddy, how did you let this happen? Right. And so at the end of the day, yes, there's been a great deal. They know, let me tell you something. I've gotten, if you look at our Facebook page, um, that image of Jesus um, and the earliest known image of Jesus and the disciples, um, I'm connected with, there's a lot of people that follow our page, right? And um, I've got no pushback. I've got no questions about that. They know the truth. I'm connected with a lot of theologians. You, are you listening? Yeah. They know the truth. And it's much easier, excuse me, for them to say, what does it matter? No, it does matter. Because, because there's a people that have been lost. And there are, there are people, there are young people that are right now in the middle of the, out there in the streets that don't have an identity. Yeah. 
here's the sad part about about black folks, most black folks. Most black folks, we can only trace trace ourselves back to a certain point in the United States of America, as if we started in the United States of America. Right. Um, if you talk to a lot of our white brothers and sisters, they'll take you all the way back to Ireland and right. and they'll take you all the way back to some other land and and because they they erase that truth. Let me go a little bit further than that. Watch this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Don, you ready for this? Mm -hmm. There's a song that we all sang, um, and we all sang in, in uh, Sunday school as kids called Kumbaya, my Lord. That's right. Okay. Um, this song, the slaves got off the ship singing Kumbaya. And let me make sure I pull this up. And uh, where is it? At? Oh, there it is. And there was a white man that heard these, overheard these slaves singing the song "Kumbaya, My Lord," and, and he patented it or whatever. What do you do? Copyright? Yeah. So he copyrighted it, and he made money off of it. "Kumbaya, My Lord," "Kumbaya." But here's what it literally means: the word "Kumbaya" is Hebrew. It's a Hebrew sentence. Yep. And the Hebrew sentence, I'm scrolling here. It literally means, uh, hold on. Are you on the Times site? I'm on uh, uh, the briefs. Here's, here, here it is. Um, in him in Hebrew, it means stand up, arise. Uh, Kumba, which means father. Yah is translated as God of Israel. Okay, arise. Father God of Israel. Kumbaya. That's the type of truth that they're that they want to hide from from us. But here's what's happening. Um, Lewis and I had this. This was several months ago. We went through this research. And I'm not saying it's a consequence, but I'm just going to tell you what's happened. The research or the statistics show that there is a shrinking Anglo population worldwide. Yes. All right. And so much so that globally, white people will be the minority in, in by year 2040. Yeah. I'm talking about globally. Yeah. Okay. There is a there is a growth spurt. Guess where? In Africa. Yeah. AIDS. They threw AIDS in there. They threw Ebola in there. They threw they threw everything at Africa. Yeah. Okay. But there is a growth spurt and a swell and a revival that's taken place in Africa, India, Asia, and those different places. But but the people, the people group that um, just so happened to have perpetuated much of the evil on planet Earth is shrinking. That's Google it, look at it, research it, look at it. It ain't I didn't do it. It's just happening. <laughs> okay. Um, Lewis, what am I going to say? My wife, she does. She thinks when I present stuff, I don't always present stuff. And 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 um, I didn't say anything. I just said it, it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of information. And if we're going to evident evident base, it has to be, you know, proven, which it's there in the Bible a lot. Most of the so, time. so so um, what what have we proven so far? Yeah, good stuff. So. 
I think we have proven, and you guys keep me honest, I think we've proven that humanity began in a Kushite territory of the land of Ham. I mm -hmm. think I think we've proven that. Yes. Okay. I think we've proven uh, that uh, Nimrod, a Kushite leader, I'm sorry, a Kushite descendant was the first world leader and that uh, it was it was leading a group of people whose only origin was Africa. So they had no other origin. They weren't Europeans, they weren't from Turkey, Australia, and from Africa, the continent, all right? All right, uh, we went on further to uh, demonstrate that uh, after the flood, uh, there were eight people who survived, uh, Noah, Mrs. Noah and their, and their sons and their uh, wives. And the oldest was Japheth. And according mm -hmm. to Genesis chapter 10, verse mm -hmm. five, he is the father of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't say it, God did. So he is the father of the Gentiles. If you wanna know who the Gentiles are uh, in the New Testament, Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. We looked at a map of his uh, missionary journeys and he was only in Europe. He didn't spend any time in Africa. He didn't spend any time in Saudi in, in Arabia, only in Europe. So that also leads me to believe that Gentiles are the Europeans, okay? Um, <clears throat> we also further, uh, and tonight what we started doing is uh, demonstrating that the uh, 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 Shemitic people have an African complexion. Yeah. This is just the beginning stages. We're gonna go over this uh, in uh, some more next week, but the Shemitic people have an African complexion. Again, so this is important because as you begin to identify people, one prophetic thing, uh, we're all familiar with the Antichrist and the scripture says that he's going to, the Antichrist is going to confirm the covenant uh, uh, in the last week. We know that last week is seven years, right? Mm -hmm. I often struggle with this idea. What does he mean, confirm the covenant? Well, prior to the rise of the Antichrist, you had these two folks that showed up, right? Moses and Elijah. And guess what? When these two dudes showed up, they don't look like Charlton Heston uh, and uh, Yul Brenner. And the world is like scratching their head because I thought they were white. Who? Them? Black? These two black guys? So the Antichrist is going to confirm that the covenant is with the people, the dispersed people that is us on this call. That's the covenant he's going to confirm. During that same time, you go through, you read Daniel, you go through and you read uh, Isaiah, there's going to be a return in Ezekiel, there's going to be a return of the Jewish people into their, to the, the Hebrew people into their land. The only way for these folks to return to their land is they have to dispel the folks who are already there. There's 144,000 that's gonna be resurrected the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel chapter 36, I think that's where it is. That's the army that's standing before the Lord of hosts that's going to usher in this uh, return back to the land. We're talking about Bible prophecy, last day's prophecy, stuff that's going to matter. And the world thinks that the Jewish population, that the Hebrew people, excuse me, are white. And they're going to see these two black guys stand up, call down fire and, and do the ministry that they had while they were on earth. And they're going to be in awe. And wondering like what in the world is going on here you said your what's your name again sir the reporter on cnn uh my name is elijah like elijah from the bible yes but i thought you were white <laughs> so you know it's that's just not going to be the that's just not going to be the case i'm sorry so i'm kind of helping to I, about I understand that that anger i went through that anger phase already yeah i understand um, so, I found it. First lady. I found it. I just found the scripture. The one that you said that um, the scripture about confirming the covenant with yes. many for about one week. For a week, yeah. I found it. So that. Daniel. And, the, and I, Where? It's Daniel 9 27. 
and he shall perform the covenant with many for one week. So this, the passage in Daniel nine is talking about, is talking about the, the kingdoms are going to arise in the last days. Um, I'm sorry, the time frame of the last days. Uh, this is where we get our 21 day fast from Daniel's 21 day fast because he was fasting and praying, repenting for the sins of his people because he read in Jeremiah that they were going to be in captivity for 70 years. This is all Daniel nine. So he, and then the angel shows up and says, yeah, oh, by the way, Danny, uh, those 70 years, is se 70 years is 70 weeks of years. You find mm -hmm. out that a week is seven years. So it's 490 years. So then he takes that, those 490 years of those 70 weeks and he begins to make some divisions. 60 and two weeks, seven weeks and one week. This is all Daniel 9. The 62 weeks was when Messiah was until Messiah was cut off, but not for himself. It says somewhere in Daniel nine. And then there is the, uh, the matter of the seven weeks, which he doesn't really address. And then it says he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Talking about the last week. You just got to do the math. 62, seven and one. That's 49 or four, uh, 49. Uh, I'm sorry, 62, 71, 62. Yeah, that's right. 62 weeks, seven and one, six, seven, 70, 70 weeks, uh, 70 weeks of years or 490 years. But that's all laid out in Daniel chapter nine. I'm not making it up, but don't believe me. Go back and read it for yourself. So oh, there, yeah. there's literally no way in the, and that's in, in, the, in the last remaining minutes. And thank you so much for your patience, guys, because we're way over time. Um, we, we really only have two more sessions left. Uh, after this one, I don't think uh, all of the content will be will be covered. So if um, probably going to need probably going to need um, one extra week, I'm thinking. Are y'all cool with the one extra? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You guys, you, you, you guys are awesome. Uh, so one extra week. And so let, let me, uh, let me close by saying this here. Uh, this information is important to God. If it wasn't important to God, he would have excluded it from the scripture. Mm -hmm. He could have just left in the scripture, how to be saved and how to sing and how to pray and to read your Bible, but he left he left so much rich, richness in the scripture and um, and he really does want us to study to show ourselves approved unto God. He, he really does want that. Um, I've mentioned it before. There's a passage of scripture in Proverbs. And I don't remember where, but it says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and it's the honor of kings to search it out. So God really wants us to dig in and not do surface. And honestly, I think we can all admit that we've done surface for so long in our Christianity. Yeah. And we're yeah. really, we're pretty tired of surface. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we really do want to know what those hidden treasures, the, the, the riches of God are. We do. And, and we those do. riches of God uh, can only be ascertained by effort. It's not going to be given to us. They, you, you are rewarded based on your labor, and um, and it's an individual choice, right? You can decide to dig in and figure it out and see about it, or you can decide to not to. And that's again, that's that's a choice that we have to make individually. What God really wants for us is to uh, is for us to dig in and understand uh, who He is. Um, and what he intends to do uh, with the earth in the last days. Hey, hey, Lewis. Yes, sir. Can I take 10 seconds, say one more thing? Go right ahead. Okay. Uh, first lady, I'm going to send you a, um, I just sent it to Don. It's the racial makeup of the world over time. Uh, Lewis and I, we talked about it several months ago, but it shows the global population shift. Okay. And if you can send it to, 
Um, so I don't have everybody's uh, have contact you. information, First Lady. I'd appreciate it. Got everybody, Angela. But it, but it, it clearly says that if you look at European, if you think back, at one point Europeans occupied uh, made up fourteen point nine six percent of the population, right? And this is back um, a long time ago. In the early 1900s, uh, their their population globally was 34.72 of the global population, okay? Asians represented 34.23. Um, Africans, rep and during the most oppressed time in the early 1900s, Black folks represented only 6.2% of the global population. Well, I'm skipping some things, but you fast forward to the projection. What they're projecting in uh, in 1950, the Anglo population shrunk to 30.42. In the year 2000, the global Anglo population shrank to 20.53. In 2018, the Anglo population shrank to 16%. It's projected in year 2100, the Anglo population will shrink to 11.14%. And the um, the populations of other groups, particularly uh, African, um, will grow to 32.51 percent. The um, uh, South Asian 21.81 percent. So there's a shift. So the question is, people are scared. There are people that are scared. And Calandra, you you probably listen to this, and and That's and right. Mother Wanda and Tanika. Yeah. People are motivated by fear. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Um, yes. Everything that's going on at the border is motivated by fear. It's fear. It's like, yes. because they, these numbers, it just took Lewis and I looking at the census, and the census data on, on government websites to find these numbers. They know this. And this is why their po their policies are to protect and to keep this from happening. That's right. And this is why there were so many people of color saying, "I don't know about that COVID shot. What are y'all trying to do to, to us?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> you understand? Mm -hmm. Because they know this. Mm -hmm. And now I don't know why this this why the Anglo population is projected to shrink to eleven percent by year twenty one hundred. And that black folks are expected, the population expected to grow to 32.51%. I have no idea why that is. Okay. But, the, but here is the data. Hmm. And I do believe God is in the data. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway. Yes. That's All right. All right. Guys, again, thank you so much for uh, your patience and your time tonight. And we'll pick this up next week. Uh, Kalandra, do you mind closing us in prayer? Father God.